that in a sense for me tell me something about uh, the zeitgeist of all time and I hope uh, little the same with first snapshot one of the 2017 so there are recent factors uh, issues of the third world quarterly many of you have seen this uh, which is a journal that is dedicated to the post-colonial problems and challenges uh, an article was published by Bruce Gilly, a professor at the Department of Political Science in Portland State University, entitled Decays for Colonialism. And the title uh, of the article says almost everything, but uh, I read the abstract. The abstract reads as follows. For the last 100 years, Western colonialism has had a bad name. It is high time to question this orthodoxy. Western colonialism was, uh, as a general rule, both objectively beneficial and subjectively legitimate in most of the places where it was found, using realistic measures of those concerns. The countries that embraced that colonial inheritance, by and large, did better than those that spurned it. And by colonial ideology, imposed great harms on the subject's peoples and continues to pour sustained development, development and a fruitful encounter with modernity in many places. Colonialism can be recovered by weak and fragile states today in three ways. By reclaiming colonial modes of governance, by recolonizing some areas, by creating new Western colonies from the scratch. Well, published in a uh, Respect Journal, the World Quarterly, with which I collaborated in the past. You can imagine that the uproar that this article created. Fifteen members of the editorial board resigned. Um, but it shows, in fact, the miseries of the peer reviewing system which we have today, and ways in which, very often, the editors can twist. Uh, the procedures also of the peer review article. As a colleague of ours from the London School of Economics wrote right after this article, uh, is that the case of poor colonialism is a travesty, uh, the academic equivalent of a Trump tweet uh, clicked by <laughs> two footnotes. Well, it is first snapshot. Second snapshot, last Thursday. The also very respected Wall Street Journal published a very large report titled The Demand for American Sperm is Skyrocketing in Brazil. <laughs> Over the past seven years, and it's part of the report, 
over the past seven years, human salmon imports from the west of Brazil have served as more rich single women and lesbian couples select donors whose online profile suggests that they will yield light complexion and preferably blue-eyed children. Brazil is one of the fastest growing markets for imported salmon in recent years, uh, said Michael Orchard, the laboratory director of the Virginia Bayes Fairfax uh, Cryo Bank, a large distributor of the, the biggest exporter to Brazil. More than 500 tubes of frozen salmon frozen in liquid nitrogen, nitrogen arrived in Brazil airports last year, up from 16 in 2011. U.S. firm bank directors said preferences like those of Brazilian passengers hold across their global market. The vast majority of what uh, we have and what we sell are the Caucasian, blonde-haired and blue-eyed daughters. In a ratio, and then the, the journalist comments uh, this, the preference for white donors reflects a persistent preoccupation with race in a country where social class and skin color uh, correlate with blaring accuracy. More than 50% of the Brazilians are black and mixed race, a legacy of Brazil, having imported more than 10 times as many African slaves than US, and it was the last Western country to ban slavery in 1888. The descendants of white colonizers and immigrants, many of whom were lured into Brazil in the late 19th and 20th centuries when the ruling elite explicitly sought to whiten the population. That was uh, uh, eugenics of 1918, she's referring to. Control most of the country's political power and wealth. In such a racially divided society, having a fair skinned offspring is often viewed as a way to provide a child with better prospects for higher salary and fairer treatment by the police. Third snapshot The Atlas Network, that many of you may have heard of which is a large aggregation of several highly conservative right-wing, extreme right-wing, some of the think tanks throughout Latin America and many other continents, funded, is uh, considered the soft power of the State Department, funded by the State Department, by the National Endowment for Democracy, by the Koch brothers, and by many others, has been very active in Latin America since uh, the 90s, and uh, they have been funded uh, by funding not just foundations <laughs> with the neoliberal ideologies, uh, uh, as I will explain in a moment, but also trying to fund the groups that have been uh, uh, mobilizing against the leftist uh, governments in Latin America. So there is a list of groups that they have funded, in Brazil, is Mo uh, Movimento Brasil Libre, the Free Brazil the Movement, that is funded by the Koch Brothers. Uh, the leader has been the Liberty Academy of Koch Brothers, and uh, they are everywhere in Latin America, wherever there are uh, marches, protests against the leftist government. And uh, uh, they have been uh, supporting uh, these uh, groups even as well. Uh, in uh, Chile, they funded partly this, uh, uh, Sebastian Piñera's election, mm -hmm. uh, and also a Mauricio Macri uh, mm -hmm. foundation by the Atlas Network, which is led now by an Argentinian, in fact, it's uh, Fundación Pensar, uh, was merged into a political party, which was Mauricio Macri, political party that led to his election. Uh, in Brazil, the same. So, this uh, group uh, has been working throughout the continent for many years, and finally, uh, their task was, in fact, uh, to eliminate politically, in one way or the other, by elections or by coups or whatever, all these leftist, uh, or for them, leftist uh, progressive uh, governments, um, sometimes with coups. Uh, the first coup, as you know, took place in 2009 uh, with the support of Hillary Clinton. The emails are now available, uh, and the Fundación de Volterra. In Honduras, that's a very influential uh, foundation now in Brazil. So, in Honduras. 
So the idea is that the, according to the intercept, which for some of you know is was funded by, is created by uh, Glenn Greenwald and uh, a very respected journalist, US uh, journalist. Uh, in fact, today in Brazil, they have uh, hundreds of think tanks, uh, not just to think, and um, it's also to act against the progressive government. And Elie Beltrão, who, who is the leader of the Institute of Mises, Mises, you know who he is, the uh, American uh, philosopher, said recently in an interview, and it's published, said the following. It is like a soccer team. The defense is the academia. The forward guys are politicians. We have scored a few goals. Said referring to Dilma's impeachment. The midfield, he said, are the cultural guys, the shape of the public, uh, public opinion, the media. The instruments of them are very close, uh, uh, disclosing, unfortunately, through the Freedom of Information Act, we have uh, now the records of the State Department involvement, uh, and also through the whistleblower Chelsea Manning, that most of you know, we know. The campaign, how the campaign to destabilize the uh, Uber Chance was organized. In 2006, a cable laid out the strategy of the US ambassador, uh, William Brownfield, for funding politically active non profit in Venezuela. One, strengthening the objectives, strengthening democratic institutions. Two, penetrating Chavez's political base. Three, dividing Chavismo for protecting vital U.S. business, five, isolating Chavez International. Well, this is the third snapshot. The fourth uh, snapshot. Latin America is the most unequal and most violent country in the world today. Salvador has the highest rate of feminicide in the world. And uh, in 2017, the assassination of transgender and travestis in Brazil was the highest in 10 years. Uh, last year in Brazil, uh, more people were assassinated than in Syria, even though Syria is in war, war and uh, Brazil is in peace. In Colombia, which is the recipient of the US military assistance, the third in, uh, in size after Israel and Egypt, the assassinations of social leaders is on the increase. I've been very active and participating in the peace process in Havana, in Dao, in Quito, in the other land. And uh, in, while this uh, peace process goes on, last year, uh, 170 social leaders were assassinated. 50% more than in 2016. And uh, the leaders are that are being assassinated in Colombia, a country that I know very well through my work, are in Cauca, Valle, Nariño, and Chocó. That is to say, the, the regions of the country where there are disputes of territory, land, basically. What is the issue? Basically, as the FARC got demobilized, and as the FARC leave those regions, the multinationals enter to take Whole of the land for monoculture agriculture and for mining. And since the social leaders resist against that, they are assassinated. Particularly the Afro descendants. Yesterday, a dear friend of mine in Chicago was the leader of the Afro Des, which is the association of Afro descendants in Colombia, was assassinated. And as you know, the same is happening in other countries, and um, I'm not, not even talking about Central America, uh, but uh, Brazil is a good example now. Uh, Marielle was, was a very good friend of mine. Uh, we were uh, at Maré, the favela, very recently, and I'd like to tell you that on uh, the 16th and 17th of June, I'll be at that favela, it's for the settlement, for two days, in a workshop of the Popular Universal Social Movements to honor and to continue the struggle of Marianne. And Marianne is just one example of many others, because, uh, as you know, after her, already three more municipal deputies have been assassinated in, uh, in Brazil. 
what this shows is a pattern very closely similar to the one in Colombia. In Colombia are the local leaders that are being assassinated, the ones on the ground. So we are as distinct to the uh, Colombianization of Brazil. Fifth snapshot, March 14, 24, that is yesterday. The South African Daily, Mail and Guardian, contains a report titled White Genocide, How a Big Lie Spread to the US and Beyond. What is this? It's the news that have been, fake news basically, that have been spread uh, throughout the US uh, and then Africa and then Australia that the whites are the victims of genocide in South Africa and therefore they need uh, help from other countries. So the Australian uh, Minister of Interior immediately said that they are a priority and they'll get a fast track uh, visa uh, to enter uh, the Australia as well as white uh, Kenyans and all the other whites that are in danger of being disseminated, uh, eliminated by genocide. This is fake news. There is no increase in deaths of white people in South Africa. We know now how it was distributed. It was Breitbart in the United States, to a, a coalition between Breitbart, I know that most of you know who they are, uh, Stephen Bannon, uh, which is associated with Sudlanders, which is this extreme rights group in South Africa, and they decided to create this approach about white genocide. <coughs> and uh, the Sudlanders are associated with uh, a person that you should probably know. His name is uh, William Johnson from the American Green Party, who recently proposed, according to the respected uh, Southern Poverty Law Center, everybody knows the Southern, uh, Southern Poverty Law Center, Johnson proposed a constitutional amendment that will revoke the American citizenship to everyone non-white inhabitant of the United States. <laughs> Fifth, sixth uh, snapshot, and the final one is enough. And <laughs> yeah, this one is apparently contradicts the ones that I've just said. That's, that, that's what the beauty about the zeitgeist is, is that this kind of is a little genius. It's not the same in the same direction because in society everything is contradicted. I just came back from South of the Bahia, from the World Social Forum. I have been one of the founders and initiator of the World Social Forum that started in 2001 and we were at the 13th World Social Forum meeting in Salvador Bahia, more than 30,000 people from around the world, and most people, in fact, from Brazil, most people, young people, uh, that were there basically stunned by the reality that is so shocking that people really have some difficulty in figuring out how so much retrogression was possible so rapidly and so violently so in a country which up until recently had a kind of apparently vibrant uh, democracy where the progress 50 million out of poverty and all of a sudden we are on the brink of dictatorship with military occupation in Rio Janeiro and probably other countries will follow. And even though we are preparing for the election, it's not sure at all that the election will be held. I'm sure that if Lula is, uh, they are waiting for the imprisonment of Lula because they expect that there will be a great approach if he is uh, is uh, if he is uh, in prison. And if he is in prison, then there is a social crisis, an emergency crisis, and the emergency crisis uh, calls for the cancellation of elections. Uh, I know that sociologists are very good at predicting the past, not the future, but uh, I cannot resist uh, this one. And I may fail, and I hope I fail, because I'm uh, very involved in this uh, process. Well, as you know, the, the World Social Forum came to life as a kind of an alternative to the globalization of the World Economic Forum in Davos, as a kind of a counter hegemonic uh, globalization. In 2001, we, we even had uh, a chat, a conversation with George Soros in Davos, 
And we, in Porto Alegre, apparently, on equal ground, on equal foot, ah, oh, you are wonderful people, you are so good, yeah, you, are, you know, you have different topics and so on, created the illusion that there was a symmetry between the hegemonic globalization and the counter-hegemonic the globalization. Of course, there was none. It was absolutely none. And in fact, from then on, there was a organized internationally a, a big movement to control, neutralize, minimize uh, the aims, the objectives, the ambit of the counter hegemonic globalization uh, and the counter hegemonic globalization of social movements in Latin America and throughout the world uh, came to uh, see uh, lots of lots of difficulties. Uh, just to give you an example, in 2016, uh, we held the World Social Forum in Toronto, uh, in Montreal, uh, and uh, almost 400 visas were refused to social movements from the South by the security forces, the joint forces of Canada and the US, because they either coming from Islamic countries, or uh, countries that help Islamic terrorists, or countries that are not safe, and for that reason, social movements cannot move. So people are being localized as globalization expands. The neoliberal globalization expands. But it, it is true that the, the World Social Forum was an image of emergencies. I call them uh, sociology of emergencies. An emergency out of the social movements that were uh, developing as a reaction against the neoliberalism of the 80s in the Americas, which was a very, very different period for the continent and we saw the rise of popular, progressive, uh, uh, left, uh, you know, the name uh, may be controversial, we can discuss that, in several countries, the first one in Venezuela, 1998, and then Argentina, and then Brazil, and then Bolivia, and Ecuador, and Chile, and Honduras. It was a continent in which for a while it was even possible to discuss socialism of the 21st century. It was the only continent in which this concept made some sense. I have to say that I always felt that it was a false debate. And it was a false debate basically because uh, due to the presence of a revolution that we very much respect, even though uh, we have been very critical of it, like myself, the Cuban revolution, we refused to discuss the errors of the socialism of the 20th century. Without discussing the errors uh, and the crimes of the socialism of the 20th century, it is impossible to discuss the socialism of the 21st century. But in any case, it showed how offensive the struggles are were, because it pointed to a post-capitalist future. Right. Everything started coming to an end. Uh, first coup 2009 against Manuel Zelaya in Honduras. Uh, 2012 against Fernando Lugo in Paraguay, 2016 against uh, uh, Dilma Rousseff, and then also by elections, Macri uh, defeated Cristina Kirchner uh, in, uh, in, in Argentina. When we deal with these institutional coups, I'm not talking about the Argentinian case because it is an electoral process. Good or bad, that's what it is. All the other cases, respect the same pattern, institutional, they sometimes involve, there are some, some specificities, uh, some involve the military forces, like in Honduras, others don't, but they always involve the, the parliament and judiciary, and foreign intervention. In Honduras it's very well documented, and uh, in Fernando Lobo's case it's not so well documented, in the case of Dilma it's very well documented. So, I think that, uh, this, in my view, composes a zeitgeist. But in order to understand that, we have to start the analysis, because this is, these are just facts, so they are not analysis. So let's start, let's start the analysis. And I'm going to invite you to three or four layers or levels of analysis. The first level of analysis uh, respects the political processes that took place in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Latin America 
in which were in fact a product of the strong popular mobilization with social movements uh, during the final part of the 80s, the NSD, the movement of that last was created in 1985, and therefore there was this strength, mobilization, and so on. Well, we know that in 2010, the first decade of, uh, of the, the millennium was a brilliant decade because of, of all this uh, redistribution of wealth. Basically, the same model, not a very radical model, in fact, the model had been suggested by the World Bank all along. They called compensatory policies, not the social rights European style or social democracy style, but compensatory policies. Uh, I'm a zero and uh, uh, family bonus and so on throughout the country. But the fact is that 50 million of people left poverty in, in Brazil. And the same in, in Ecuador. And the same in Bolivia. A middle class was created. And now we have to evaluate why, why it was possible and why it is in 2010 that the crisis started to emerge. But I think that at this stage, for us sociologists and for you, I'm sure, uh, in such an interdependent world, it's more and more difficult to distinguish between internal factors and external factors. Because both internal factors and external factors are so intermingled one with the other, that it's very difficult to tell them apart. But in any case, for heuristic reasons, I would say that there were some internal factors and also external factors. Internal uh, that led to this. Basically, this is the model of development which we came to call neo extractivism because it was based on unprecedented exploitation of natural resources, was pushed by the development of China. The double digit uh, development of China that asked for was hunger, for hungry for every kind of natural resources. And therefore, was unprecedented the potential natural resources. If you notice carefully, this is a continuation with the colonial, because the colonial was really based on the exploitation of natural resources, not on the industrialization. During the first decade of the millennium, we are going to witness a deindustrialization of Brazil. Deindustrialization of Brazil. The same in Argentina. Everything is focused on monocultural, industrial agriculture, and natural resources. Of course, we know that the cycle of the commodities is a cycle that takes usually 10 years. The prices go up and then come down. In this case, because everything depended on China, they came down faster. And when they came down faster, the crisis started. Why the crisis started? Because since there was a boom, it was possible to have a win-win situation for us, a win-win party. The rich would become richer and richer, and the poor a bit less poor. And therefore, there was no fiscal reform, no political reform, no media reform, nothing. But once the crisis came, it was impossible to keep the social distribution without taking some wealth from the rich and giving it to the poor. That is to say, taxation. I'm not talking about the taxation of Europe, uh, 1948, 45, in which the richest people in Germany or Norway paid 75% of their, their wealth in, in taxes. Not talking about that. But 30, 40, whatever, they are paid less than 10% that. So it was not possible. Because since in the meantime, the neoliberalism gave the money, was so prevalent in society, through the media, through the distinct tanks, that to tax the rich, it was completely out of question, an argument. Because these countries had no other alternative than to resort to World Bank, to the IMF. But if you resort to IMF, you have to respect the conditionalities, and the conditionalities is no taxes on the rich. And then because of the neoliberal hegemony was so prevalent, there is a very curious, uh, sometimes uh, caricatures, uh, that, that shows the reality. Uh, Rafael Correa decided to impose a very small inheritance tax 
to the super rich in Ecuador. That would cover 1%, probably at the maximum 2% of the population. It was fiercely resisted against in the time. By whom? By the middle classes that would never be taxed by them in that sense. If we need examples of neoliberal hegemon, well, this is a good one. So, in the process, this, uh, this uh, part this, because of the political system in Brazil is very clear, they unite themselves with the, the right and this uh, disqualified many of their policies and eroded their social base. And uh, so the social movements lost contact with popular governments. And uh, it took several forms. Uh, Rafael Correa in Ecuador went to the extreme of trying to evict the, the building where the CONAI is uh, based, a uh, very widely respected organization with whom I've been working for many, many years. In Bolivia, Maria Fuente Morales tried to divide the religious movements. Now we have now two CDOPs, we have now two CONAPACs, which are the two, the Mount the Andean and, uh, and uh, the Amazonian indigenous organizations, they are divided. One in favor of Evo and one against Evo. So this division against the social movements. In Brazil, the same. They took the same, and there is, a, particularly after Lula, the same erosion of the social uh, uh, base. So the left, in a sense, if they were left, forgot that at one lesson of this period. And then when the left is in power, they control the government. They don't control the political and social problems. When the right is in power, they control both the government and the social and economic power. This asymmetry is absolutely telling to explain why corruption in, in Brazil or elsewhere is not the same thing if committed by the left or by the right. Double standard. But we Europeans should be very familiar with that. The people that have studied the Weimar uh, courts are, during the period of 1918, 1921, they know the double standards of the courts in Weimar when the, the violence, in fact, the violence, armed struggle from the extreme right was coming and from the Spartacus, from Rosa Luxemburg and from uh, Lid Nash. Very harsh sentences against the extreme life and sometimes <coughs> Very lenient and even pattern to the extreme right violence. Double standard. The same, of course, is that for Korea. It's not new, but um, we should know that they can always different forms also. Well, in, 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 in result, I would say that a missed opportunity is what, as I read this, this period, is a missed opportunity. It's in several, in several instances. Because also, during the first millennium, the first decade, America and the U.S. influence in the continent, which has historically so prevalent, as we all know, uh, the list of interventions, imperial interventions, are such that it is difficult to, not to notice them. During the first decade, the U.S. was completely focused on the Middle East. They almost forgot about that. They return in 2009 where the, the coup against one of the symbolically speaking. That's the first presence. The second presence are the, the 13 military bases in Colombia, in Colombia to compensate for the closing of the Manta uh, base in, uh, in Ecuador that was closed down by the uh, Correa. So, I think that that opportunity was lost because the reforms that could be, have taken place, uh, they didn't take place. Political reform, the media reform. Whenever we talk about media reform in the, in, in the Americas, the international, the, 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 the Commission Interamericana of Human Rights, the Interamerican Commission of Human Rights, comes upon us immediately saying that you are against freedom of expression. Now, the freedom of expression in Brazil means that two or three families control the public opinion in Brazil. And the same in Argentina. So, this is really outrageous, and these progressive governments thought that these media were their friends. Well, they were their friends while they could serve, and not make them. 
So I think that these internal factors allow us to see part of the story. But there were also external, a mixture of external and internal factors uh, that destabilized all these movements. The movements were demobilized by this period, and they, the, the governments were more vulnerable to attacks by the media because of their isolation. <coughs> I would say that there are two factors that we have to analyze in the future. The, the imperial intervention in the, in the United, of the United States, with the collab active collaboration of the Euro European Union, I have to say, uh, is now military dictatorships. Uh, the media and judiciary is what we call lawfare. Lawfare is a concept that was developed in military jurisprudence. Uh, and we in the United States, we have been studying very, very closely how this concept developed and, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's a very respected concept in the military jurisprudence. But now it's been civilized. Uh, that is to say, it has been transposed to civil affairs. And in fact, we have seen this lawfare, very active lawfare for me today, as a point of analysis, we have here a very, very important uh, young and promising sociologist of this topic in Brazil, back to uh, Caio there and uh, Luciana Zapolon there. They have done a fabulous work, in particular Zapolon with, with a thesis, that show the following. And we have now the data, the data now are available, that's also something new for us. In fact, for last week, the people that are working with big data have a great disappointment. I am sorry for all of you because Facebook just blocked the access that people have to the big data after the scandal of Cambridge Analytica. Uh, nobody knows if it, it is for good, but I have been approached already by two students that are absolutely with, uh, on the brink of uh, a breakdown, nervous breakdown, because their data are gone. Well, the lawfare, uh, just an, uh, uh, an example because it would be too, too, too lengthy to go on, is, it, is the collaboration between the Department of Justice and uh, the prosecutors in Brazil taking care of the car wash uh, scandal, the, the struggle against corruption. So it's very well documented. It's conducted by two officers of the, of the, the Department of Justice, Kenneth Planck and Trevor McFarlane, and we have the videos of their cooperation. It's very interesting what they say about the conviction of Lula, in, uh, of the President Lula in the, the federal uh, court. They say that our collaboration, judiciary cooperation between the United States and Brazil, has been very intense as far as the evidence to condemn Lula da Silva is concerned. And what we did is, and I transcribed, is a first relationship that allows us an informal exchange of information without relying on the cooperation, on the formalities of cooperation, because it's too slow and too late. So by phone, you call. So do you remember the telephone justice of uh, the Soviet system that we used to call the telephone justice? Some guy from the central committee would call the judge and say, well, that's the way. You know, things are the way they are. Okay, but I don't think that this, this level of analysis is a good one to, to tell us what is going on. So I move on to the second, uh, to the second one, um, but probably, uh, but it's time if I, if I miss the fourth, but I, I'll, I'll try to do my best. Well, the second level of analysis, uh, deeper analysis than I view, is that America is not an isolated concept is part of a broader picture and uh, it is a continent probably whose specificity is the fact that the joint combination which we need today and for the work on the knowledge of the South that I've been proposing is basically concerned with the fact that the domination of our societies is composed of capitalism, colonialism and patriarchy or ecopatriarchy and they work together. One is not more important than the other. The three of them work together. It's always in tandem. And the tragedy of the resistance is that the, the domination acts together and the resistance uh, acts fragmented. Feminist movements, 
uh, struggle against patriarchy, but they for capitalism is very often, and they forget capitalism, and die capitalism very often. Anti-racial movements fight against racism and colonialism, and sometimes they forget sexism, and they forget anti-capitalism. Trade unions and capitalist struggles, they sometimes forget the, the uh, racist, anti-racist struggles and anti-sexist struggles. As long as you are divided, domination is united, it is impossible to uh, resolve this problem. But what is the conjecture at this point? I think that, well, you know, that the second level, and probably very brief, is the following. The social movements in general reflect the waves of globalization. They tend to be very strong during the high time of globalization, and then they go through a deep crisis when the rivalries among countries increase. So we have three, <coughs> according to me and many others, we have three waves of globalization in modern capitalism. The first one takes place between 1960 and 1914. And all the globalizations, I should add, is based on a new technological innovation. In this case, the steam engine, the telegraph, and the electricity, 1860-1914. When this uh, globalization enters in crisis, the rivalry among countries develops and wars may stop. The two wars are the product of that. The second, uh, and we have, of course, a country's money globalization there, which is the workers' internet. The second wave, or second globalization, takes place between 1944 and 1971. Here, we have jet planes, television, communication satellites, container traffic, new innovations, which are very important to move along <coughs> products and people. And we have also an anti uh, uh, country's money globalization, uh, the globalization of uh, the anti colonial movements, Bantum Conference, 1955, of course, and May 68, which is also a student movement across the world. And then we have uh, while in the first globalization, Great Britain was the dominant power, in the second wave was the United States, and was not colonialism but Cold War. In the third wave, starting 1989, and we are just ending in the deep crisis of this third wave, uh, the innovations with the microprocessor, the personal computer, the internet, and so on. Well, we are at the crisis of this one. And this, what was the view of this, is that the dominant power was the U.S. together with the European Union and the rise of China. That's the new, the rise of China. That's the new form of the imperial structure of the dominant power in the world. Now we are in the deep crisis, and the deep the cries are at the tail end of this uh, mobilization, so the movements are on the defensive because the rivalries among countries are much more violent now. Uh, example, the trade wars by, by, by Trump, what is this? The rival is, uh, the Middle East is the play field now of, the, of this rivalry among the different, uh, the different dominant powers. Dilma Rousseff in Brazil had to be neutralized because Dilma Rousseff was a key element of the BRICS, which were the alternative to the World Bank and to the dollar as reserve, international reserve currency, uh, together with Russia, China, South Africa, and India. And it was probably the most democratic country was the world. And that's why it had to be neutralized. And now all the riches of Brazil are on sale, and uh, they, are, they will sail in the most, uh, uh, I don't even have words to qualify the way in which they were given away the riches of the oil the uh, deep uh, sea oil of Brazil to the different companies, uh, US companies, of course. So we are in a trade wars, we are going to have more wars, but now the, the enemy is China. So the, the wars probably will move to Asia. That's why the attack to North Korea. Or North Korea is not important for anything. It's a way of embarrassing China. Because they are, the, we have to, you, you cannot forget that of the 20 trillions of debt of the United States, 6 trillion are, are in the hands of the Chinese. So they cannot attack Chinese directly. They have to do otherwise. It's like Russia and, and the past. So 
Maybe another way of globalization is coming up. Everybody thinks that this would be a way controlled by automation. Automation would be the, uh, the Amazon model of production would be probably the, the one in this. But I think that if you want to understand the challenges, I think that we have to move to an even deeper level of analysis. And that's when I focus a bit with the last part of the presentation. I think that uh, if we analyze closely, I think that we have a political challenge and an epistemological challenge. The political challenges could be read as follows. Is the idea, which in a sense I also mentioned to you, that is difficult for uh, the critical thinking, uh, particularly West Eurocentric critical thinking. We always uh, were trained all of us that uh, the ones that share the critical thinking from the Frankfurt School to any other school, uh, Marxist school, non Marxist school, that class is more important than race and sex as forms of domination. So, as I said, they work together. So, for me, it is very clear that at a, at a crisis of globalization, which is always a crisis of the rate of profit of capital, that's why we need a new innovation, with will be automation probably, no? at, a, at a crisis of the profitability, capitalism becomes more savage, more anti-democratic, incompatible with democracy. And that's what we are facing now, more and more. The two global factors Financial capital and internet, they don't know democracy in terms. They don't know frontier, they don't, they don't know borders. Internet is a double edge, as you can see today. And global finance capital has no loyalty whatsoever with the people because it's the markets that count, nothing else. And we have seen that in the, the way in which the Greek crisis was conducted here in Europe. We don't have to fly away to travel far away to Tanzania or to Indonesia or to Mexico to see the disgrace of the austerity measures applied in this way. So I think that the social movements, and that's our struggle in the world social forum, has been uh, not a great success of united, uniting these different movements. It is true that now we have many, many movements in which articulation is already there. I spend all my Friday with marvelous black women. They are fishers and uh, in the fisheries of the Ilha da Maré, which is being destroyed by the pollution of the industries. And these are brave women because they are black, so they are rubbish. They are, of course, non beings, so to say, and they are being victimized by the industrialization of Brazil, but they are struggling. They know that their struggle is not a struggle for identity. Uh, uh, a feminist identity is for the political economy, is to save the Manglars, is to save their ways of life, their life. So it's politics, it's political economy, and it's sex, and it's race because they are black. So everything is, of course, for them uh, uh, very clearly uh, connect. So, what is then the deeper challenge? Is the psychological. We, when I say we, most of us social scientists, literary people, humanities, in the global north, or working in the south with global north ideas, are completely capable of understanding what's going on. And I speak for myself, for the effort I have to make to try to see finally something. I start by analyzing, of course, as anyone, starting with Charles Stevie, that I knew very well, and all the Columbia uh, model of the social movements in literature. Look at the different concepts, resource mobilization, political process, contagious politics. Everything unfolded in the US context. Everything absolutely inadequate for the state social movement in the Americas. We don't capture the reality. We don't capture the intensity of the struggle with these concepts. We need other concepts. For several reasons. First reason, the dichotomy is upon which these concepts are based. There are three 
dichotomies we are absolutely deleterious for all the and detrimental to the analysis of that. Individual community. If you look at the paradigm, it's very clear that this dichotomy, as any other dichotomy in the North Eocentric knowledge, always hides a, an asymmetry. Individual first, community second, always. Well, with this dichotomy, we cannot understand what is going on with the Afro descendants, with the indigenous, with the peasants, with the women, throughout the world, and most particularly in the case of the Americans. Because very often, people get it first, and the individual can last. And this creates tension within the feminist movement, within the black movement. All of us know very well, those that work with the social movements have no romantic idea about them, and we know these tensions. They are sometimes productive, sometimes they are destructive. But this dichotomy, these concepts, bring with them a dichotomy that is a false dichotomy because it hides them. The second one, society nature. All of our analysis is based on this dichotomy, and of course society first nature is the Cartesian nature, not the Spinozian nature, natura natura, but natura naturata, which is Cartesian too. There is to say nature, as uh, natural resources completely freely and conditional to our disposal. This is as true of liberalism as it is true of Marxism. This does not capture, cannot allow us to understand the struggles of these women, of these men, of these groups, of these communities throughout the country. Because for them, nature is society and society is nature. Society, nature does not belong to us, we belong to nature. Nature is the Mother Earth. And the Mother Earth, as the blood, is a living institution. And therefore, that's why in the Constitution of, of Ecuador, <coughs> Article 71, the human rights of the Pachamama. Only in this continent we could have that. It's not to respect. Who is respecting this idea? Because this idea of what I call sociology of emergencies. They are emerging new ideas that our concepts don't capture, but the social struggle forces them into a political analysis. Have you heard, probably of New Zealand, that recently decided to grant human rights to a sacred river of the indigenous people in New Zealand? And a few months later, to a mountain, which is also sacred for the indigenous people? <coughs> Do you know how the Prime Minister, a woman from New Zealand, responded to the opposition, where the opposition criticized that? That, that uh, rivers are not humans, they don't have head, they don't have limbs, uh, or arms, they don't have legs, they, they don't have sex. How can they have human rights? The Prime Minister answered, what about the business companies, the corporations? Do they have sex? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a devastating argument, quite frankly. A little bit rhetorical, but it was very effective. <laughs> So, New Zealand, out of the will the, of the, the white population, the settlers population of New Zealand, no, the struggle of Mahali. For a long, long time, they learned that. So I think that this second dichotomy is done with us in order to understand. But there is a third one that incapacitates us, is what I call an epistemology of blindness. Incapacitates us to see. Things. Because this requires a deep sin, and we are unable of doing deep sin, is the distinction between immanent and transcendent. We come from secularized societies, and for us, the transcendent is only the religious or the sacred. Well, for indigenous people, the immanent is not religious, not even sacred, because a mountain may be sacred, the river may be sacred. Of course, the immanent, the transcendent, is spirituality. After 1648, I think the Europeans and the Westerns became incapacitated to understand spirituality. And I have to say that in my field research, I feel absolutely incapable, I have to recognize that, when my leaders, the leaders of the indigenous people, when we are united or in a meeting, uh, side 
that their ancestors are with them, are with us in the meeting. I, from Portugal, cannot see the ancestors, but they can see them. What is this? Mystery. No, it's a different way of seeing. So these uh, these dichotomies makes us incapable of understanding, but there are a, f a third one, a fourth one, which is even more detrimental. Is a distinction between subject and object. Our methodologies in social sciences, and I speak against the discipline of which I'm trying to be a good member, are extractivist methodologies. We are as extractivist <coughs> as the mining companies. We extract information, not knowledge. Knowledge is ours. Our informers are informers. They provide information, we provide knowledge. We forget that they have knowledge. And their notorious knowledge is very important for us. It should be very important. So we have to change our methodologies. Not extractivist methodologies. We have to move from knowing about to knowing with. And this is quite a challenge. How do you do that? Well, here you need an epistemological term. And I have been claiming, uh, I call them uh, epistemology of the South. South, as you can imagine, is not a geographic South, it's an epistemic South. The South exists in Europe uh, among the refugees. The South exists among the undocumented refugees with whom I'm next week I'll be in Copenhagen because Copenhagen is very civilized. There's a lot of refugees to leave the camp for an hour, a few hours to have a meeting with me with a, 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 a visa and then to go back before night to back to the internment camp. Uh, so this is, of course, possible because we are in a civilized country. But the Ipsmars of the South, of the South, comfort of the South, is the knowledge born in struggle. The knowledge born in struggle of those that have been hurt and unjustly hurt by capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy or patriarchy. I have to say that for several years I have used the concept of coloniality because I think that the smallest of the South are part of the larger family of the colonial studies. In this book that is coming out by Duke University Press, The End of Cognitive Empire, I justify why I abandoned the concept and I now use colonialism, not coloniality, for a very simple reason. Capitalism today is completely different from the capitalism in the 17th century, and we still call it capitalism. Why have we reified a form of colonialism, which is historical foreign occupation, uh, colonialism, and all the other forms of colonialism are not real colonialism? It's a trap, a theoretical trap. So I think that if we do that, we develop something that this model of, of social movement do not allow us to understand. That that's the final part. Is that there are two types of exclusion in our society. What I call the abyssal exclusion and the, the non-abyssal exclusion. The non-abyssal exclusion is the exclusion that occurs in the metropolitan forms of sociability in which people are equal, they have rights. Of course, a woman is not is discriminated against because for the same work, she doesn't have the same pay, and it is excluded. That's not a visa excluded. But on the colonial sociability, there are visa exclusions because people there are non-beings. They live in zones of sacrifice like these black women in the Isla of Mad Island of Mare. They are non-beings, they are subhumans, and therefore they are not treated the same way. And many people in our world, in Europe, traverse, there is a, some of you that are familiar with my work, I, 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 I describe as a pizza line that divides metropolitan sociability for colonial sociability in our cities. This woman that works in a restaurant in Paris, of course, is excluded because she has rights, 
uh, she has a contract, but for the same work, not the same pay. Not a visa exclusion. But when this woman goes home, can be victim of a gang rape, can be assassinated by the partner, can be victim of any decide. When that occurs, she crossed the visa line to the zone of non-being, to the zone of sad humanity. There she is not true a human. It's the same with refugees. It's the same with undocumented. It's the same with black lives that don't matter. It's the same with all of them. So if you do that, then you can start thinking that we should call, and of course that would be a very complex task, we could call for other concepts. In my case, there are six or seven that we have been producing collectively in my, the group that it says uh, has been shared by so many, the sociology of absence, sociology of emergencies, the ecology of knowledges. We think today that science is important. But it is not the only rigorous knowledge. We need the colleges of many different knowledge. Because then we have today very many occasions in which this notorious knowledge, this traditional knowledge is so prevalent. As I usually tell to my students, if I want to go to the moon, I need scientific knowledge. If I want to know the biodiversity of Amazonia, I need indigenous knowledge. So <laughs> different knowledges for different purposes. And therefore, but we in our places, uh, because we are not capable of intercultural translation, which is another key concept for me, I think that it is difficult for us to understand. Why it is this? It is difficult because it will take generations. I know that there are lots of young people here, uh, and uh, I think that uh, probably they are more hopeful than the ones that are my age or, or, or younger, but not so young, so much younger, because this will involve decolonizing our universities and decolonizing our research institutions. But that, that would be another talk. Thank you.